Chapter Thirty Five of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baron Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Thirty Five Unsuccessful. On leaving Ashburton, Pasco Pepperell was relieved of the attendance which had been so irksome to him. He would not, probably, have carried out his purpose between Newton and Ashburton, as that was a high road, much frequented running through cultivated lands, and with farms and cottages along it at no great intervals. Nevertheless, the knowledge irritated him that someone was following him, that should an opportunity otherwise propitious arise, he could not seize it because of the man in the trap at his heels. Never able clearly to bring all contingencies together before his inward eye, in the conduct of his business, he was now more dull and confused in mind than usual. He took it into his head that there was something menacing in the pursuit, that the man in the rear was aware of what he had done at the cellars, that he foresaw his present purpose, and was intentionally following him, keeping him in sight, either that he might deliver him up to justice for what he had done, or to prevent the execution of his present design. It was consequently with immense relief that he heard the man's cheery, "'Good night,' and his wheels turn off by a by-street, as he trotted through Ashburton and along the road leading to Dartmeet and Brimps. At a distance of rather over a mile from Ashburton, the Dart is crossed, and then the road climbs a steep hill, cutting off the great sweep made by the river as it flows through Holm Chase, and it crosses the river again as it bursts from the moor at Newbridge. Nearly the whole of this way is through woods, and it does not pass a single human habitation. Directly Newbridge is crossed, the character of the surroundings changes. In place of rock, and woods of pine and oak and beech, succeed the solitude and desolation of the moorland, heather, and firs break, with at one spot only a cluster of small cottages about a little inn, with a clump of sycamores behind them and a few acres of mountain pasture before them, laboriously cleared of granite boulders. Immediately after passing this hamlet, the road traverses moorland entirely uninhabited. Tors rise to the height of from twelve to fifteen hundred feet. Their sides are strewn with rocky ruin. Dense masses of firs cover the moorland sweeps, and between the clefts of the rocks whortleberry grows rankly into veritable bushes, hung in June with purple berries. Below, at the depth of a thousand feet, foams and roars the dart amidst the boulders and bushes of mountain ash and thorn. It was obvious to the clouded mind of Pepperell that if he was going to get rid of Kitty, it must be done either in the Holm Wood or on the moor. One place was as good as the other for disposal of the child's body. The dense forest growth, or the equally dense whortle and firs, would effectually conceal it. When the first dart bridge was crossed, and the steep ascent begun, Pepperell said roughly to his niece, "'You ain't going to sit here and make the horse drag you all the way up this tremendous hill, be you?' "'No, Uncle dear. I was only waiting for you to draw up that I might jump out. Do you see the moon coming up behind the trees, shining through them, like a good thought, in the midst of dark imaginings?' "'Dang the moon in your imaginings! Get out!' "'I was thinking of something my book says,' apologized Kate." "'descending to the road. "'Your book! What do you mean?' "'I mean that which the schoolmaster gave me, "'which I have read and read, "'and in which I always find something new, "'and always I am sure of something true. "'What does the book say?' "'I learned it by heart. "'Within the soul a faculty abides, "'that with interpositions, "'that means things which come between, "'he explained that to me, I cannot always make out what is said till it is explained. But when it is, then the full truth and loveliness rises and shines into me, like the moon when it has got over the hills and the woods. Go on. A faculty abides, that with interpositions which would hide and darken, so can deal that they become contingencies of pomp and serve to exalt her native brightness. I did not understand what contingencies meant, but he told me, and now all is quite plain, as it is quite true. And it goes on, As the ample moon, rising behind a thick and lofty grove, 
burns like an unconsuming fire, light in the green trees. Cease this foolery, said Pasco impatiently. He was fumbling in his pocket for his clasp knife and was opening it. Do look, Uncle dear, exclaimed Kate, turning to observe the moon as it mounted over the rich Buckland woods on the farther bank of the dart. Halt, shouted Pasco to the horse. They had reached an eminence. The girl stood wrapped in delight with the silver shield of the moon before her, casting its glorious light over her face and folded hands. Pasco had his knife out. She heard the click as the spring nibbed the blade firmly, but did not turn to see what occasioned the sound. The moon has come up out of the trees, just as he said. I mean the poet. Like a power in the heart and soul that has been entangled in all kinds of dark and twisted matters of every day. Oh, uncle, what is that? Pasco drew back. A white dog, a mongrel, short-haired lurcher, crossed the road. Simultaneously a whistle was heard, and this was answered by another in the distance. "'There are poachers about,' said Pepperell. He shut his knife, pocketed it, and called Kate to get into the trap. He was not going to halt to see a darned moon rise. When all kinds of vagabonds were about, and there was no safety for honest men. Pasco drove rapidly down the hillside into the Dart Valley at Newbridge. The road was mostly in shadow, but the bare moor on the farther side was white in the moonlight, as though it had been snowed over. The horse was tired and tripped. Pasco had to be on his guard, lest the beast should fall. In the shadows of the trees it could not see the stones that strewed the way. At the bottom of the valley flowed the dart. The rush of water breaking over the rocks was audible. If a harm came to you or me in the river, I reckon the body would be washed right away to Charpator, said Pepperell. Uncle, said Kate with a laugh, that would be going uphill. I'm getting mazed, growled he. So it is. Well, folk would say one or the other of us had come by an accident among the rocks of Charpator and tumbled into the river and been carried down by the stream. That's likely, eh? I suppose so, uncle. But if anything were to happen to one, the other would know, and do all he could to help. Of course. Pepperell was looking at the brawling torrent. And if anything were to chance to one here, the body would be carried right down the chase for miles till it came to the other bridge. I dare say, uncle, but don't talk like that. Let us look at the moonlight. There is a man yonder, by the side of the river. A man? Where? By that large stone. He is catching salmon. Not a fish has a chance up here on the moor. What a parcel of rascals there be. Pepperell drove across the bridge. He had intended, he hardly dared articulately to express to himself his intention. Again he was frustrated, just at a suitable point, by this fellow catching salmon by night. Beyond the bridge the road rose rapidly. Both uncle and niece were forced to descend from the cart and relieve the horse. Some six hundred feet had to be mounted without any zigzags in the road. Kate walked along cheerily. Pasco lagged behind. The horse, with nose down, laboriously stepped up the steep incline. Pasco took out his knife and cut a branch of thorn from the hedge, and in doing so tore his fingers. He put the thorn behind the seat. When the summit of the hill was almost reached, he said to Kate, I shall turn to the left, and leave the road. What? Out on the moor? Yes. I think we can cut off a great curve and avoid the cottages. You walk by the horse's head. I will mount and hold the reins. There are large stones in the way. This was the case. Kate thought that her uncle was rash in taking the track across the moor at night, a way he could not know, merely to save a mile that the road made in detour but she said nothing. She was pleased to go by a way that commanded the gorge of the dart, and had no fear, as the moon shone brilliantly, and every bush and stone was visible, as in the day. The mica and spar in the granite made each rock sparkle as though encrusted with diamonds. A heavy dew had fallen. Cobwebs hanging on the firs 
were as silvery fairy tissue. Rabbits were out sporting, feeding, darting away with a gleam of snowy white tail when alarmed. Owls were flitting and hooting in the ravine. The wind from the east hummed an aeolian strain in the moor grass and heather. The moon rose high above all obstruction to its placid light, and Kate breathed slowly, and in the chill air her breath came away as a fine, shining vapor. Every now and then the cob struck out a red fire spark from the stones against which his shoe struck. Kate held the reins at the bit and paced at his head, her heart swelling with happiness as she drank in the loveliness of the night till she was so full of the beauty that her eyes began to fill. Pasco Pepperell was silent. He was knotting the thorn branch to his whip. His eye was on her. Presently the track on the turf ran at the edge of a steep slope. Rocks from a tor overhead had fallen and strewn the incline, and formed fantastic objects in the moonlight, casting shadows even more fantastic. A sheep that had been sleeping under one of the rocks started up and bounded away. The spring of the sheep close beside him alarmed the horse, and he started back, plunged, and dragged Kate off her feet. Then, with a cry of rage, Pasco rose in the cart, whirled his whip around, and lashed the cob with the full force of his arm, at the same time that he raised the reins in his left, and beat with them as well, and jerked at the brute's mouth. Kate was down. She had slipped. She was before the plunging beast. Pasco saw it. He swore, lashed this side, that, then at the flanks, at the head, at the belly of the tortured beast, that leaped and staggered, kicked and reeled under the strokes of the thorns which tore his skin. He snorted, reared, put down his head. The steam came off him in a cloud. There was one thing the beast would not do, rush forward and trample on the fallen girl. Pasco saw it and cursed the horse. He flung himself from the trap. He rushed at the bridle. His foot was on Kate's gown. Uncle, uncle, she cried. With one hand he dragged the horse forward, with the other he swung the thorn bush. A step, and the hoofs and wheels of the horse and cart would be over the girl. Then a thrust would suffice to send her down the side of the slope into the torrent below. But the brute leaped into the air before the swinging thorn bush, swerved up hill, dragging Pasco at his head, and flung him over a rock. His hand became entangled. He could not for a moment disengage it. He was dragged forward. The headgear gave way, and Pasco fell among the bushes, crying out with rage and pain. Next moment, Kate stood before him. "'What is the matter, Uncle dear? Are you hurt? I am safe.' End of chapter 35